Welcome back to the next video, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about Galois representations attached to elliptic curves over the rationals. So let's get to it. Recall, what is a Galois representation? A two-dimensional Galois representation over a topological ring A is a group, continuous group homomorphism rho from the absolute Galois group of Q to GL2 of A. And its residual representation is the natural map rho bar from that absolute Galois group to GL2 of K sub A, where K sub A is the residue field of A, which is A mod its unique maximal ideal. So how do you attach a Galois representation to an elliptic curve? Well, you can attach one for each prime, actually. So let's let E over Q be an elliptic curve, and let's let P be prime. For each natural number n, the absolute Galois group of Q acts on the P to the n torsion group, E bracket P to the n, which, as we recall, is isomorphic to Z mod P to the n Z squared. This action is easily seen to commute with multiplication by P. E is a group, so multiplication on by P, uh, multiplication by P on E makes sense. And so in other words, G sub Q acts on what we call the p-adic Tate module of E, which we write T sub P of E for. And by definition, that's the inverse limit over N of the P to the N torsion of E. Now, each of these guys, the P to the N torsions are isomorphic to Z mod P to the N Z squared. And so when I take the inverse limit, I'll get Z P squared, the p-adic integers squared, okay? In other words, so a Galois action is the same thing as a Galois representation, right? So. There's a p-adic Galois representation attached to E, which we call rho sub E comma P, which is a continuous group homomorphism from GQ to GL2 of CP. Okay, what does flatness mean in this context? Uh, we're gonna be concerned with when the residual representation rho bar EP is flat. That representation is flat at a prime L if there's a finite flat ZL group scheme F over ZL such that the Q bar L points of the P torsion of E are isomorphic to the Q bar L points of F. Okay, so that's what flatness means. It means the, the locally, all the points locally at L on the space that you're acting on with Galois are this form a, form a scheme structure over ZL. All right, and what I want you to realize is that we're going to be focusing a lot on when these representations attached to elliptic curves around ramified at various primes, but you're always going to have ramification at P itself, and so flatness is the correct analog of unramification at the prime P itself, and you'll see what I mean when we get into theorem one later in a moment here. Okay, let's recall the cyclotomic character. For P prime, let's let chi bar sub P be the reduction of the cyclotomic character chi sub P mod P. So chi sub P encodes the Galois action on all of the P to the nth roots of unity at once compatibly. So what should the reduction do, chi bar P, what's the residual representation here? It encodes the Galois action just on the pth roots of unity. All right. A touch of representation theory before we get into our big theorem for the day. Let's let V be a vector space over a field K. We say a representation of a group G given by rho from G to GLN of V is irreducible if rho has no non-trivial proper G invariant sub-representations, okay? And then we'll say rho is absolutely irreducible if rho K bar, which is the representation given by G maps to GLN of V tensor K bar is irreducible. What is this map? It's just rho. And then you compose with the natural injection of matrix groups from GLN of V to GLN of V tensor K bar over K, okay? And then it's just easy to check that if you're absolutely irreducible, you're also irreducible, all right? A little bit more elliptic curve theory we'll need before we get into the big theorem. The theory of complex multiplication, I'll just say a very little about this. Let's let K be a number field. We say that an elliptic curve E over Q has complex multiplication over K. If the K linear endomorphisms of E, that as a group contains more than just the multiplication by N maps bracket N for N and Z. So in other words, look, you have an elliptic curve. There is a multiplication by N more endomorphism on it for each N and Z because Z is a group, right? If there are any more endomorphisms than that over the field K of choice, we're gonna say E has complex multiplication over K. And we'll say, in general, we'll say E has complex multiplication if it has complex multiplication over C or something, okay? 
Uh, it's easy to see using the theory covered in, for example, Silverman one that an elliptic curve E over Q does not have complex multiplication over Q itself. In fact, there's a thread about this on Stack Exchange called elliptic curves over Q have no complex multiplication, but they might have comp complex multiplication over larger fields. Okay, so here's the big theorem from the day. Theorem one, it's got eight parts to it. So the first half is on this slide. Let P be prime, let E over Q be an elliptic curve, let rho EP be the p adic Galois representation attached to E, and let NE be the conductor of E. Then four things are true about rho EP that we care about. First of all, the determinant of rho EP is cyclotomic. In particular, rho EP is odd because chi, rho, chi P is odd, okay? Two, which primes are these guys unramified at? Rho EP is unramified exactly outside P times the conductor of E. So at all primes that aren't P and which don't divide the conductor, this representation is unramified, meaning inertia is trivial. Okay, uh, well, image of inertia is trivial, I should say. Okay, how about the irreducibility of these guys? Rho EP is absolutely irreducible for all primes P. Okay, and then four, if E does not have complex multiplication of any kind, okay, then rho EP, hence rho bar EP, is surjective for all but finitely many primes P. All right? Now, the second half of theorem one deals with rho bar EP and these same kinds of properties. What do we have when we move down to the residual mod P representation? Okay. If E is semi-stable, so from here on out, E is semi-stable, meaning it has everywhere good or multiplicative reduction, and delta M of E is the minimal discriminant of E, then four things are true, okay? Debt of rho bar EP is chi bar P, as expected, okay? So uh, rho bar EP still has cyclotomic determinant, just like rho EP does. All right, how about unramified, absolutely deducible, all that stuff. If L is a prime that isn't P, then rho bar EP is unramified at L, if and only if P divides the L attic valuation of the minimal discriminant of E. Okay, so look, what, is this, what does this mean? The minimal discriminant is a number, right? And L divides it to some power. That power is the L attic valuation of the discriminant. If P divides that, that's the same thing as rho bar EP being unramified at L, as long as L isn't P. Well, what happens at P? Well, what I told you is that at P, you should replace the condition unramified with flat. Ideally, that would be the case. And it turns out, you kind of see that in action here. Rho bar EP is flat at P, if and only if P divides the p-adic valuation of delta M of E, okay? So you get kind of the same condition that's equivalent to flatness as you had for unramification by changing L to P, which is good evidence that unramified should be replaced at P with the condition of flatness. I mean, this is not obvious, right? It's not obvious that these two conditions should be related to each other in that close of a way. This is just something about inertia. And this is something about finite flat group schemes. What do those have to do with each other? Well, this is, this is a deep result, okay? Now, how about, uh, are these residual guys absolutely useful? Well, we don't quite get the same strength of result here. Rho bar EP is absolutely irreducible for all but finitely many P. Up here, Rho EP was absolutely irreducible for all P. Unfortunately, the, the same cannot quite be said about the residual mod P representation. Okay, how about the proof? I'm just gonna give you a ton of references, all right? A lot of these statements are quite difficult. Diamond and Sherman, cover, uh, chapter nine covers one, two, and five, right? Three and eight are, I would say, among, if not the main results in Sayre's Green Book, Abelian L attic representations and elliptic curves, which I'll call SAR from here on out. Four is the main result to the follow up of this book by Sayre, his point, uh, Galois properties of points of finite order paper, which I'll call SPG from here on out. And it's basically a consequence of what happens in the Green Book with quite a bit more work. All right. Statement six is shown essentially using the exact same Tate p attic uniformization argument we used to prove proposition one about the Fry curve. Seven is a little tricky, this flatness thing here. Uh, 
it's kind of easy, but you have to be well-versed in your algebraic geometry. It's covered in Proposition 8.2 from Edith Sobin's The Weight and Sayers Conjecture on Modular Forms, which I'll call EWS from here on out. And then I'm gonna make her a big long remark here about the proof given in there, because uh, you won't, it's very likely you won't understand the proof given in there unless you realize a few things. So I'll just make some comments here for those that decide to go read that. If P is a prime of multiplicative reduction, the XI from Sayre's definition of Poe Ramify is our Q from Tate theory. That's gonna come up in the proof that Edie Sobin gives, okay? We already know how its valuation is related to the valuation of the minimal discriminant, okay? When you want, if you understand that, you'll understand proposition 8.2 here in the multiplicative reduction case. If P is a prime of good reduction, we have the flatness automatically. Because in this case, we just have a model for E over ZP by definition, and we can take its P torsion subscheme and tensor up to ZP. And I claim this is flat. And the fact that this is flat follows from a generic theorem about flatness of torsion subschemes of abelian varieties in general. And this is discussed probably in a variety of texts on abelian varieties, but I know it's in Mumford. Okay, Mumford's abelian varieties, which I'll call MAV from here on out, or MAVs. All right. So there's your references. You can go look up all this. I tried to make sure this was quite thorough and that the references uh, gave detailed proofs and they do. Um, the only thing is, again, you might want to read these remarks if we're going to go read about the flatness. Oh, I just want to make one other comment too. Um, if you read Sarah's works, SAR and SPG, you might be tempted to think that, for example, three and eight, uh, yeah, three and eight, as they are worded here, are incorrect because Sayre's results uh, hold for elliptic curves over any number fields. And in the theorems, he says that the elliptic curve up front, if it's over K, cannot have complex multiplication over K. But remember, I'm taking an elliptic curve E over Q here. Any elliptic curve over Q cannot have complex multiplication over Q. So when I specify Sayre's results to the number field Q, I get that these absolutely irreducibility these absolute irreducibility results hold for all elliptic curves over Q. I don't have to put a qualifier out front that says let E over Q be an elliptic curve that doesn't have complex multiplication over Q. I don't have to say that because every elliptic curve satisfies that property if we're over Q, which we are. Okay. Anyway, so I'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching.